minutes before start time and click on the join in class link. You can also watch many of our classes at a later date. This is our second semester to offer business classes. They are branded Empower You Business and are meant to improve business skills. They are held on Wednesday evenings at 6 o'clock and each class costs $10. At the end of our program, there will be time for questions from those in attendance, as well as our virtual guests. We ask you to please remember to wait for a microphone before asking your question so that those online can hear. Empower You is a free university powered by donations. The costs incurred include website, contact, constant contact, printing and advertising, virtual, some speaker and personnel expenses. To allow us to continue offering these classes, we always pass a bucket towards the end of our class, and we welcome any small donation you'd like to give, and we um, appreciate your understanding for the cost that we incur. Please feel free to provide any comments or feedback on any session you have attended. Also, we value any input on ideas of topics or speakers you may have. You can reach us at in info at empoweruohio.org. Thank you for attending tonight, and I'd like to present next our director of Empower You, Dan Reganal. See if we, there we go. So um, we've got the first year anniversary of our session of our uh, of our studio here, and uh, boy, we've had a lot of good sessions. So speaking about some of our classes, were any of you at our session last night in the city of Cincinnati? This gentleman was. I remember him well. Uh, Denise was. Um, it was a wild one. Um, uh, that, is that the best way to put it? Maybe uh, it it was a wild one. It was on the city of Cincinnati being a sanctuary city. And um, I think it was safe to say that people had their opinions on the subject. And uh, what I took away from it was, Nita wrote me a note today, what I took away from it was not a lot, really. Um, basically, the whole sanctuary city, the way David Mann kind of presented it, was that it's just a, um, kind of a PR thing, and we just want to be welcoming to people, and don't worry about it. Because when the people get arrested, and we don't ask them anything about whether they're illegal or, or an immigrant, and they go to the Justice Center, that the Justice Center will worry about it. Is that what that is? That, is that, that's what they said. So what I've got for you is an article I'll pass out when I'm in a couple minutes on what the sheriff of Hamilton County says about that. And um, he does, you know, these politicians, they kind of have a way of kind of walking around the edge so he says, I'm taking the side of the law, and I will only ask them if they, uh, he says something about, I'll let you read what he says, but I'm still unclear after even reading this, whether when they go to the Justice Center, there's, they're ever really asked or um, shared with the um, people from Immigration Services. But it was an interesting session, and um, We've got just a couple I want to tell you about. First, I want you to give Betty Overstreet a round of applause. She's a great board member for us tonight. We've got Bill Roll, our treasurer, back here. Bill, raise your hand, please. And we've got Bill Moore also, who's a big help. And uh, Andy Scarth, who's our producer back there. We couldn't do it without his help. So we've got, um, we've got a, big, a big week next week. I hope you'll be able to make uh, a few of our sessions. Monday, Tuesday night, right here at Empower You Studio, we're going to have the Dream Facilitator at Rivertown Brewery, who will be in here and talk to us about making craft beer, how it's made. You'll get to taste ingredients, 
you'll get to taste some actual beers that night. And uh, I'm told she's just really excited about coming to empower you and um, and talking to us about the craft beer movement in Cincinnati. So um, I hope you can join us for that. Then the next night, this is the session Nita told me I needed to send some people um, from last night to. Uh, it's called Crucial Conversations. Um, and um, it's all about how to make it safe to talk to almost anyone about anything. So we could could have used that last night, uh, maybe. And um, um, and I've seen that class. It's a great class. And it doesn't. We're calling it a business class because in business sometimes it's kind of hard to um, confront the inevitable. But it's also very valid in your own personal life. I mean. Uh, sometimes my 25-year-old son seems to kind of rule the world, and uh, how to have a conversation with him or a, another family member or anyone. And the speaker's great, Jane Steinmetz. So that'll be next Wednesday, and then next Thursday, uh, we had a one of our students, Georgia here, uh, recommended that we have um, Wade Johnson in to talk about tri-state trails, all the places around town where you can uh, walk and hike and um, and, and really get out when it gets to be spring. And that, that is going to be a, um, a great session also. And then the last one I'll tell you about is a week from Tuesday, Grace Marie Turner will be here via Skype. And you've, how many of you have heard her on Brian Thomas's show talk about healthcare? Uh, she's great. She's uh, one of the national experts on the issue. And she'll be talking right up to date with what's going on with the healthcare bill um, in the House and the Senate. And she'll be joining us from Washington, D.C. Uh, that'll be a fantastic event. So, yes. Oh, yes, thank you. I'm sorry I got that wrong. Thursday's session is not here. It's at Sims Township Library, which is just right um, on the way up to Loveland. It's a great venue. We really wanted to go back there. So thank you for reminding me of that. Uh, with that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to our great executive director, Nita Thomas, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you, Dan. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight also. And um, maybe we should have had that crucial, crucial conversations before last night. I'm not sure. <laughs> So um, I'd like to introduce the speaker tonight, Joe Eaton. And um, Joe Eaton is the program director for Faster Saves Lives. It's, it started out as a school safety program provided by the Buckeye Firearms. The Faster program was created in 2013 by concerned parents, law enforcement, and nationally recognized safety and medical experts to allow teachers, administrators, and other personnel on site to stop school violence rapidly and render medical help immediately. The purpose is not to replace police and EMT, but through professional firearm crisis management and emergency medical training, school staff are providing an effective response needed to save lives and buy the victim's time until the professionals can arrive. And um, i just like to say that I saw Joe a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, at a meeting give the presentation, and I was so impressed. I thought other people really need to see this. And so I asked Joe to come here, and he said his presentation was basically just for schools, but they were kind of tailoring it to be to small business and other people, and it would be better if we waited till they tailored it a little. So he agreed here to be tonight, and I, I'm really thankful. I think this will be one of the best presentations that you've ever seen, and, and I thank him for coming. And we do have a, tour, a door prize. Actually, we have two door prizes tonight. Joe, you want to come and... Pick up the tickets. Seven nine six six three five. Three five. All right. Now you can take your choice since you won first. 
There's two flashlights. One I thought would be good for a woman to put on her keychain, and maybe one good for a man to put in his pocket for emergencies. She took the man's. Okay. <laughs> Seven nine six six five zero. All right, there you go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Oh, you don't need this. Well, you're going to get thanked yet one more time, and I do have to find my helper out here who's going to let me know if the microphone is okay. She's not listening to me, so I don't know if the microphone is okay or she's ignoring me. Are we good? We're good? All right. Again, I thank you guys for coming out tonight. Um, this entire topic, this program, is consumed a lot of hours, a lot of my, my work over the last few years, and we're glad to see that people are getting more interested in this and looking to get the information. The overhead pictures that you've been seeing scrolling here the whole reason that this program was put together you can't look at these 27 faces up there and not see a wife a sister a grandkid a child a niece a nephew or something in these photos whose lives were cut short just a few short years ago for absolutely no reason we'll give the technology a test here perfect this presentation actually is the opening presentation that we give at our Faster Saves Lives program. The Faster Saves Lives program was started in 2013. It's funded right now entirely by the Buckeye Firearms Foundation. We're a 501c3 nonprofit educational charity. We spent a lot of years doing youth firearm safety training. Uh, we would do youth shooting events, sponsoring both national and Olympic level people in the shooting sports. Uh, we would sue the city of Cleveland every couple of years when they would decide to get stupid and stomp on your Second Amendment rights. So that is where we spent 2008 up until the very end of 2012. In, after the Sandy Hook Elementary School tragedy, we were invited to a town hall meeting in Columbus not even two weeks after the event occurred. And before we could attend that event, the board of directors for the foundation sat down and said, this is ridiculous. Every single time that one of these events happens, we go to a town hall or a round table or a panel. We say our side, the people that want firearms removed from the honest law abiding people come in and say their side. Everybody pats themselves on the back and goes home. Nothing changes. The board of directors said, this has got to stop. We've got to do something different besides going in, saying the same sound bites over and over. We've got to do something that makes a difference. So, you guys, apologize. I'm like 90% of you people out there. I'm fighting a cold, so hopefully my voice will hold up well for you. You can consider us lucky or unlucky here in Ohio. We actually have three national experts on this type of situation here in Ohio. We have uh, Mr. John Benner out in Adams County at the Tactical Defense Institute. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about his credentials here because this entire program was put together by Mr. Benner. Uh, we also have Ron Borsch. Uh, we'll cover some of his statistics also. He was with the SEAL Academy outside of Cleveland, Ohio. Mr. Borsch has studied public mass murder in more detail than you could ever imagine. How many rounds are fired? How many magazines? How many shots out of each magazine? When did they start shooting? When did they stop shooting? More details and more data than you would imagine is available on this. And we also have Mr. Phil Chalmers out of Holmes County. He is a, a school violence, anti-violence ad, advocate and speaker that presents both to the school levels to teach them how to deal with it, but also empowers the students on how to deal with school violence and how to stop bullying and other things that they face on a daily basis. And our foundation went to these three experts and said, you know, what can we do? What will absolutely make a difference? And every single one of them said, just what you see right there, time is what matters in this. And I hope that we can take that point and clarify it for you tonight. Our foundation committed uh, to doing a class in the spring of 2013 for 24 teachers and staff. 
Mr. Benner had the curriculum. He said, I need the staff that want this training. The, uh, thank you. I've got, uh, we, at the time, we even had the news media were mocking us, you know. We even find 24 teachers that want to take this type of training. Who do you think is going to show up for this? Well, we didn't know ourselves. We announced it. We started taking signups within the first month of the training. We had over a thousand teachers and school administrators sign up to take this training. By the time we could hold the first class, that number had grown to almost 3,000 staff. So we figured out there are a lot of people out here who are interested in keeping your kids and your grandkids and your community safe. In the spring of 2013, we had our first class. 24 was very successful. We finished the class up and then we realized we had another problem. We could no longer pat ourselves on the back and say we've done good. We trained 24 teachers out of 3,000 teachers. That's not a job well done. So we went back to the board of directors. They authorized some more funding from the foundation and we've continued ever since. We finished our fourth year at the end of 2016. At that point in time, we have trained almost 800 school staff from 192 different schools in eight different states. We have trained staff, and I believe it is 74 out of Ohio's 88 counties right now. And the demand is still there. We had two classes at the end of last year we had to cancel simply because of funding issues and 50 teachers that didn't get the training they were desperately wanting. That The demand is still back. We have groups out of state in Colorado, Kentucky that are asking for this training. We have had people travel as far from Oklahoma and Colorado to get the training. They've called us up, said we've checked all over the United States. This is the most comprehensive program that we have found. We want to send staff across the United States to take your training. And it is humbling when you, you meet school staff that are willing to travel from Oklahoma to Ohio to take this training. As I mentioned, this program is all part of uh, Mr. John Benner at Tactical Defense Institute. I want to give credit where credit's due. This is not my program, not my presentation. He has allowed me to, to, to use this and provide this as we do to any other qualified instructors out there who are putting this out for the greater good. Uh, Mr. Benner is a, uh, spent 40 years in law enforcement. 25 of those were with the Hamilton County SWAT team. He spent 20 years commanding the Hamilton County SWAT team. Commanded one of the first multi-jurisdictional SWAT teams in the entire United States. Uh, he is a trainer with the Ohio Police Officers Training Council, the International Association of Law Enforcement Trainers. Uh, he is the co-author of the nationally used Close Quarters Personal Control Program which is the hand-to-hand -hand self defense training that was taught to all Ohio law officers for decades here in Ohio. More importantly to this, Mr. Benner spent over 12 years as the main trainer for the National School Resource Officers Training Association. Him and his instructors traveled the United States and trained the school resource officers and police officers who would be responding to these type of events in your schools and in your communities. They've ran thousands and thousands of what they call force-on-force -force scenarios where they put these police officers in situations. They are dynamic situations. They use the airsoft, the marking guns to see what happens, what works, what doesn't work. And Mr. Benner explains that he said it very quickly became evident that we're training the wrong people. No matter what they did, if they had a police officer that was 100, 200 yards down the hallway that knew what was going on, that knew he was going to have to respond to an active killer event, they were still losing half a classroom or more before he could respond 200 yards down the hallway. That's when he was there at the school and knew that this was coming on. But that's all we had at that point in time. That's changed to Sandy Hook, and now, as we said, we have almost 200 school, schools throughout Ohio which have adopted this type of program. So what is an active shooter or an active killer? You'll hear me call this active killers because that's what they are. If you guys are concealed handgun license holders in here, if you're law enforcement, if you're hunters, I hope you're active shooters. I hope you're out actively practicing and getting better at what you're doing, but you're not active killers. 
You go out and shoot for the enjoyment, for the sport, for the challenge, for the recreation. Again, words have power. These are not active shooters. They are killers, and that's what it comes down to. You also notice we will not use their names in this. That's part of what they want is the notoriety from this. Uh, the one that last happened out in uh, Oregon, I was so happy the sheriff came up and said, we're not going to name this guy. He's not going to get any credit from our sheriff's department for doing what he did. Of course, the media turned it right around and, and released it. And But they're cowards. They don't deserve to even, even be mentioned. But what is an active shooter, an active killer? Mr. Benner defines it as a person or persons who kill or attempt to kill multiple innocent people in a location generally thought to be safe for them to do so. That's the key. They look for the soft targets. Now in this presentation, <clears throat> we're not going to work on the why that this happens. There are people out there with a lot more knowledge and experience that can try and figure out why these people do what they do. What we're going to cover is the hows and the what happens in these situations. Because to solve any problem, you have to understand the problem. And that's where we missed it for a long, long time. There are plenty of things that schools and businesses and churches and stuff can do to identify threats that come from within. But if it's an event like Sandy Hook Elementary School where someone walks up to the front of that building, shoots out the glass through the walk, locked door, and walks into that building looking to murder people that are working there and going to school there, there's not a lot that you can do ahead of time to prepare or identify that individual. The history of active mass murder. Who in here has any idea when the first school massacre occurred here in the United States? Anybody want to fathom a guess? I got a hand. 1930s, that's close. Anybody else? It actually was in uh, 1764. We don't have any photos or video from that, I'm sorry, but uh, actually at the Lenape Indians, I believe it was, entered a one-room schoolhouse outside of modern-day Greencastle, Pennsylvania. They murdered uh, Enoch Brown, the schoolmaster, and nine children inside the schoolhouse. The one that most people are thinking of <clears throat> is Bath, Michigan. That one is one of the more modern ones, 1927. Numbers 45 dead, 58 injured in this event. And it's the one that most people recognize as the first modern one. Um, still holds the record to date for a school for the number of, of dead and injured. The killer was actually a school board member. He was the treasurer at this school. He was upset about taxes, and he was upset about uh, possibly losing his farm. He spent months packing the basement of the school with dynamite and other high explosives over a period of time. He said he murdered his wife, set his house on fire so he would drive all the townspeople out away from the school, and then let the, the explosives detonate in the school. When that wasn't enough and the responders came to the school to rescue it, he drove up in his truck, packed with more explosives and with, yes, we got a pointer, and more shrapnel and detonated his truck there to kill the responders that were there. I want to talk a little bit about events that changed law enforcement because, again, understanding the problem will let us solve the problem. One of the first events that really changed the way that society and law enforcement responds is the University of Texas and Austin Tower shooting. This was in 1966. We ended up with 18 people dead and we had 31 injured. Realize that this time in the 60s, the police officers out there didn't have rifles in their car. Very few of them had shotguns in their car. Most of them had the revolver and maybe a spare reload with them at the time. A young Marine climbed to the top of the tower he was prepared. He took crates of ammunition and firearms and food and supplies and toiletries and clothes to the top of the tower, barricaded himself on the tower, and started shooting people around the campus. Initially, he was able to walk freely around the observation tower and shoot people at will. The police had no way to respond. Fortunately, this was in Texas, so the Texans had a little bit different thing to say about it. Uh, there was enough other rifles and stuff around that the townspeople started shooting back at him, and that caused him to have to stay below the concrete rail and take his shots out of drainage holes 
that were around there, and they really credit those civilians with keeping the number of dead to a lower level because he now only had certain small windows that he could shoot people out of. They even brought a plane up with a sniper in it and tried to shoot him from an airplane circling the tower. That's how long all of this went on. He, the airplane had to turn away because he started shooting back at the airplane at the time. Police were driving students home to get rifles from this is how unprepared they were. The kids were saying, I live down the street, give me a ride, we'll go get our guns. It finally ended when Officer Ray Martinez, Officer Jerry Day, and a bookstore clerk climbed the tower themselves and put an end to the killer's life at that point in time. It made law enforcement look at this problem and readdress whether they were prepared for it or not. It gave rise to what we know as the modern SWAT team now, which we saw mainly start to develop out in California, Los Angeles in the 1970s, and has grew throughout the United States now. They realized they had to prepare for this type of situation. The next one that really changed our response and society's way of looking at this was the Columbine High School in 1999. We had SWAT, we had the tactical teams, we were doing everything that we knew to do at that point in time, and when Columbine happened, they pulled up, they treated it like a hostage or barricade situation, they surrounded the building to keep anybody from escaping, and they started looking to negotiate. Unfortunately, that was a total failure because that is not what these criminals were doing. They were not looking to negotiate. All they wanted was more time to murder as many people as they absolutely could. Fortunately, after this, the tactical teams looked at it and said, you know what, this may not be what we need to do in these situations. We can't sit up and wait. We've got to do something faster. So. The next iteration was they went back to the tactics guys and what did they say? Well, they're team guys, let's just form smaller teams. So you had rise of the diamond formation, the quad formations, the first three or four officers that are there, it's your day, you guys are gonna team up and go into the buildings. And so we saw that and everybody started switching and teaching the, the quad or the small teams or the diamond formations to put together the first guys with guns that happen to show up and go in and solve this problem. We're finally moving in the right direction. But that's still not good enough. Virginia Tech happened in 2007. If you remember, Virginia Tech was actually two separate events. This coward went in the dormitory to start with, murdered a young lady in the dormitory and a gentleman across the hall who heard her cries for help and came to help her and that was the first ones. He likely did it just to see if he could actually do this, murder somebody or not. At the time that the mass killing started in Norris Hall, there were two fully prepared SWAT and tactical teams on campus. Blacksburg, Virginia has their own SWAT team and Virginia Tech has their own SWAT team. They were geared up, ready to go, and had responded to the first murders and were sitting on campus when the second ones happened. We still ended up with over 30 people dead, two from the first one, 30 from the second one, and lots of injuries, and that was with two fully prepared tactical teams sitting on the campus ready to go. We're still not there. We still haven't figured out this problem that time is all that matters in these events. To help understand this, there are three levels of active killers that Mr. Benner has described. The first one, is a single person, probably has multiple firearms, very little planning goes into this. A good example is Luby's Cafe in 1991. Doesn't take a lot of planning to drive your truck through the front of a cafeteria, get people while they're sitting in the cafeteria having their lunch. Uh, present there was Susanna Hupp, who if you go online and search for her testimony for Congress back in the 1980s, she gives some unbelievably heart-wrenching testimony she had a firearm in her truck. In Texas at the time, it was legal for her to store and carry it in her glove box, but it was not legal for her to carry it out into public. So she pulled up to the restaurant to have lunch with her mother and father, left the firearm in her glove box because she was afraid she would lose her chiropractic license if she was caught with that firearm outside of her car. She sat there and watched her mother and father die 
with her handgun not 100 yards. One other one, level one, San Ysidro McDonald's in 1984. This one should have got us better prepared, but it somehow flew under the radar. Guy goes into McDonald's at the peak of lunchtime and starts shooting people in there. 21 people killed and 19 wounded. Problem with this is dispatchers initially sent the police to the wrong McDonald's. They say McDonald's in, in Evendale. How many McDonald's are there? They went to the one that was two miles away. Once the officers did arrive, they were prepared. They had rifles, they had everything at the time. The commander said, hold tight. We're setting up a command station. We've got 175 officers on the way. We want to surround the entire thing to keep anybody from getting out. The police officers stood outside and watched him murdering people inside of the McDonald's, waiting for their supervisors to say it's OK to do something. How's that for your family that's in there? Waiting to be next when you see police officers set up outside. It's a shame, but that was the way that we handled this type of stuff at the time. We didn't understand the problem. We didn't know better. It would have happened there. It would have happened here. It would have happened anywhere. That was our understanding of the problem at this point in time. In 2009, things start to get a little bit better. This is still a level one. Guy went into Pine Lake Health and Rehab Center, a convalescent home, looking for his, I can't remember if his wife or ex-wife at the time. Found out that she had just moved to the dementia ward, which was now behind a keypad, and he couldn't get to her, so he turned around and started shooting people in their hospital beds and their wheelchairs. Fortunately, this hero here, Justin Garner, Young man showed up, said, it is my day. I'm going in alone. Didn't wait, didn't call for backup. Out of the three wounded, Mr. Justin Gardner was one of the three wounded. Uh, he went in, took care of the problem. Unfortunately, he didn't quite understand the problem because the way he was injured is he addressed and confronted the murderer, and that gave time for the murderer to get off a shot and shoot and injure Officer Gardner before he could get shots back and incapacitate him. But we're now down in the single digits when they don't wait, when they go in, when they stop the killing as soon as possible. The next level that we'll define is level two, which is one or two people with a lot of prior planning, creating obstacles, possible improvised explosive devices. What's the first one that comes to mind for this? Anybody? Columbine High School was a perfect example of this. Two people on that, they spent a lot of time studying this. They planned this. They rehearsed this. They practiced this. This was not supposed to be a school shooting. This was a bombing. They built pipe bombs, improvised explosive devices, ranging from 20-pound propane cylinders with five-gallon gas cans around them, all the way down to what they called crickets, which are small homemade hand grenades. They had over 90 explosives found in that school. They smuggled in the first big explosive, set them in the lunchroom, timed them to go off at, I believe it was 11.17, because they knew they would have the most students in the cafeteria at 11.17, because that was the, the switch time. They waited outside when the explosion happened. Their plan was to shoot the kids as they came running out of school. Had the bombs went off, the casualties would have been near 500. There was 486 people in the cafeteria that day. Fortunately, the bombs did not go off as, as they had planned. They started off the event by, again, setting a diversionary fire and explosion on the other side of town to draw all of the medical and fire people away from where they were actually doing their attack. They also had bombs set in their cars to detonate after the rescuers arrived again. You're starting to see a pattern that this is this is a lot of planning on this. We got very fortunate that the bombs, we say fortunate, 13 people killed, 24 wounded, that the bombs didn't explode. One of the reports said the only reason that this didn't happen, didn't work as they planned, because they tested this. They built the bombs, they bought the timing devices, they tested this, they exploded, they worked fine. They went back to order the other 100 for the rest of their bombs, and the manufacturer of the clocks they used for the timers had switched from metal hands on the clock to plastic hands. 
from the time they ordered their samples until they ordered the ones. That's what saved 500 kids on that day. Sheer luck. They planned this for a long period of time. And what we see is even to this day, the most recent killers, we had one today in France who said, these were his heroes. He studied that. These are why he went into the school over in France, Grassy France today, and started shooting people. The other thing I'll mention is what does this what does this photo tell you? Who's important here? The knuckleheads that committed this, their victims are small little black and white photos around the outside. That is the absurd thing. Don't give these people the credit. Time Magazine and everybody else wants to glorify these and hype them up. And in my opinion, I think that's the worst thing we can do. If we'd stop giving them credit and giving them publicity, I think that we would see some decline. Virginia Tech, this guy planned it. He bought chains, locks with him. He picked a building that had the crash bars on the door so he could quickly rack chains around it. He chose one that had windows that were so small that people couldn't get out of them. It was reported, if there are any shooters in here, tell me if this sounds normal to you. It was reported that he was at a gun range practicing by laying his targets on the ground and practicing walking by them and shooting them as they lay on the ground. If you see somebody doing that at your local shooting range, you may want to say that's a red flag and report it. The last level, actually there are two different levels. Level three, A and B. A is a single terrorist on a personal jihad, and B is a full-blown terrorist incident. Um, the Trolley Square Mall in 2007 is an example of, of a level A, a single person on a personal jihad. Uh, he went into the mall in Utah, armed with an AK-47 and a handgun. Fortunately, again at the time, Officer Keith Hammond and his then pregnant wife were out for an early Valentine's Day dinner at the same mall. He was off duty. It was a no-guns mall, but he must have not seen that sign and carried his firearm with him. The report says that he had a 1911 single stack, that he had downloaded the magazine because he was afraid he was going to ruin that spring in his magazine, so he left the ammo out of it. If you know anything about 1911s, they don't hold a lot of ammunition to start with, and by not loading it full, he was really at a disadvantage going up against somebody with a, a full-power rifle. Uh, his wife was a dispatcher. She was pregnant at the time. She immediately left, started calling the police to, to get them into where the problem was, and he went to subdue the killer, was able to hold him down and keep him from moving, which saved more lives because once he had murdered the people in the area he was, he wasn't free to move throughout the mall and murder more people. Another local police officer also came in and joined him, and the two of them were able to keep the killer pinned down until the Salt Lake City SWAT team arrived and happened to come in the exact right door right behind the murderer and finish the event at that point in time. If you're carrying out there, and I encourage you all to get your training, practice and carry, carry your fully loaded magazines with you. 2009, we had Fort Hood. If you listen to the media, this was not a jihad, this was workplace violence, uh, even though the perpetrator was in traditional dress, started the attack by yelling Allahu Akbar. It was still said to be workplace violence. It really is a shame, our military bases, that our war fighters are disarmed when they're here at that, in the United States. That's something that, you know, is unbelievable. The first two soldiers that tried to stop this attack were both murdered. They attacked him with chairs and a table and tried to take the killer out and gave their lives for it. It was only then that Sergeant Kim Munley, civilian police officer Kim Munley, she was not the, the military hire local law enforcement to come in and provide their protection, was able to get shots on there. She had a firearm mis malfunction. She was wounded in the event. The killer's firearm malfunctioned, fortunately, and a second officer was able to come in at that point in time and stop the event. And we all know that that is drug on now for years and years and years and years. And in fact, there's been a second event at Fort Hood since then. Moving on to the full-blown terrorist events, 
Beslin School in 2004. How many of you remember or have heard of Beslin? Yeah, maybe 15% of us. This was after 9-11. Look at those numbers, 385 people killed in a school and 783 wounded. Imagine what that would do to us here in the city of Cincinnati. 1,000 casualties at one school in one day's time. This is a full-blown terror attack. We haven't seen this here yet, but it's got to be coming. The one thing about these terrorists is they're not liars. They may be despicable. They may be cowards. They may be everything else, but they're not liars. They have told us that we owe them thousands of our children for the wars that we have fought overseas. It's got to get here eventually. They're patient, they're calculating, and it's really a matter of time. We've got to wake up. Some countries wake up. 2014, there was a shooting in Pakistan. Terrorists went into the schools. They killed 24 people in that one attack. The very next day, they armed all the teachers in the Pakistani schools. One day's time, they had armed people in every school in Pakistan. And we're still here four years later trying to get this information out here to schools here in Ohio. Another one that we've seen is Mumbai in 2008, 166 killed, 308 wounded. This was a very well-planned attack. They hit the tourist centers, they hit the hotels, they hit the restaurants where the tourists hanged out, hung out. And the thing was, is this was all remote controlled, very professional operation. They have intercepts of the terrorists calling back to their handlers saying, what should we do next? Who should we kill? What should we do? It was all ran remotely at the time. And again, you look at the devastation that happens in these events, and fortunately it's something that has not happened here in the United States, because really we couldn't comprehend what this would do to the United States. And it continues. Ritz-Carlton in, in Indonesia, subways in Russia, Paris and Paris and Paris, and again today in Paris. Interesting side note on that is it was last summer we had a group from the 60 Minutes in Paris, France come over here to do a story on this faster training program that we're doing for teachers here in the United States. After they came here within a week, they had another terrorist attack in France, and just today, about two weeks ago, they sent us the story, which finally aired in France, and again today they had another terrorist attack along with a school shooting in there. Uh, we've got the Curtis, uh, Curtis Colwell Center in Texas. We have the office buildings, our military centers in Tennessee, San Bernardino, Orlando, Florida, and oh yeah, right here at the Ohio State University. When are we going to figure this out? The thing that you need to realize, and this is what, where the power of the FASTER program comes from, you guys don't need permission to fight for your life. In these events, it's up to you. We tell our teachers, we've probably done ourselves a disservice over the years teaching this zero tolerance to violence in our schools. I really think that that is why some of these were successful. We've shown kids that if we are getting into a fight, I start the fight, he defends himself, we're both in trouble and thrown out of school. I should be thrown out for certain, but he shouldn't be punished for simply defending himself, but yet that's what we've taught these kids. Call them kids. Virginia Tech, they were young men and women really in the prime fitness of their lives. I still look at them as kids because I have kids that are barely finished college now. They sat in their chairs and waited for somebody to come up and murder them. They did not move, they didn't fight, they sat there and waited to be murdered. Two exceptions. Had Mr. L a young man by the name of Matt Laporte, he was an Air Force cadet. He started from the back of the classroom, ran up the side, tried to come across the front to confront the killer, took eight shots and he died while he was reaching for the killer at the time. One other person in that classroom would have would have attacked at the same time. Would we have that number of dead, 32 dead at Virginia Tech? The other one was a Holocaust survivor, was over teaching at the Virginia Tech University, survived the Holocaust, comes here to America and is killed in his university classroom. 
He put his body in front of the door and ordered his kids to jump out of the second floor window while he stood in front of the door, soaking up bullets that were being shot at him through the door until he died and collapsed. All but two of the people that were in his classroom got out without any wounds or injuries. You guys don't need permission to fight for your lives. Everybody has the right to go home to their family at the end of the night, just like you do every other night. Everybody in here has the right to go home and hug your kids and kiss your wife, just like you do every single other night. Nobody should be able to take that away from you. And that's where the power in the FASTER program, I love seeing these teachers, they get that, they've got permission. They felt helpless, now they're no longer helpless. They want to make a difference, but they've been afraid to make a difference. Now they have permission to make a difference. The interesting thing about this, school shootings, how many do you know of them happened in inner city schools? Anybody name a single one? It's an urban and a suburban problem. And Mr. Benner says the reason probably is the kids in the inner city schools, they're fighters. You come in and start hurting somebody in the inner city, you're going to have everybody kicking their butt immediately, and there's probably going to be other guns in there stopping it right away. The inner city, they've got a lot of problems, but the kids that are in there are used to fighting for their survival every single day, and an active killer has more of a fight on his hands in those situations than what he, would, what he wants. And I truly think there's probably a lot, a lot of truth in that. And since to date, none have been in the inner cities, it seems to be, be following suit. How do we respond to this? If you can't escape, you have no choice. You have to fight and do something. If you can escape, by all means, get out of there. It sounds selfish, but I only owe it to myself and my family to go home. I love you guys for a lot of years, but I'm sorry. If somebody is coming in here murdering people and I can get out the back door to my family, I'm going home first. If you don't have that choice, then you have to fight about it. You must fight, otherwise you'll be killed. The main difference that we see with the active killers and what we see with the, the terrorist events, either the personal jihads or the full-born terrorist events, and we'll talk a little bit about this, is most of the active killers that we see, they're not committed. They stop as soon as any effective resistance comes about. The terrorist events, you're going to have to kill them before they stop. They are not going to stop murdering people until you go murder them. They're not going to give up. They're not going to commit suicide. They're going to have to be killed before they stop. If you're an adult male in a terrorist event, you're going to be tortured and killed no matter what. Females, you're likely to be raped before you're killed in these events. This is what occurs in these, these full-blown events. Decide right now you're going to do anything, no matter how deceitful, how underhanded, how conniving that you can do to survive and go home. And act with extreme violence. There's no fair fights. They've already decided that they've got the upper hand. They picked a place where it's not a fair fight to start with. You don't owe them anything at all. We go back to Mr. Justin Gardner. He made the mistake of telling the person to stop, put down the firearm. If somebody is standing in a thing, shooting innocent people, that person does not deserve a second chance. If you can murder them, shoot them to the ground, start patching up the wounded, and go home to your family at the end of the night. Back to Beslan in 2004. Again, the thing that aggravates me, this was after 9-11. This was after 9-11 and nobody realizes it happened. It got no attention. A thousand people in one event. How does a terrorist take control of a thousand people? There was more than that, a thousand in the number of casualties. They had total control. They didn't start killing people randomly in this event. First day of school over in Russia is a big deal. Everybody shows up. The kids, brothers and sisters show up. They bring flowers and candies to the kids. It was a nice spring day. They were all outside in the courtyard. They were having speeches. They were introducing the teachers. A couple of terrorists roll up in some trucks. They roll out and they shoot a couple of the guards and they start firing the guns in the air from behind the crowd. The crowd runs immediately into the school building where they find other terrorists are standing by the back door to keep them from running out the backside. 
That was all they did. They didn't start shooting people. They didn't cause chaos. They weren't random about it. They were very controlled in what they're doing because they knew if they start murdering people randomly, total chaos, there is no way an estimated 30 to 50 to 75 people can maintain control over 1,000 people that are panicking. After they had control and had it locked down, they brought all of the people who were in charge of the school up and they murdered them. There was a lot of young babies in there. Babies are crying, they're hot, they're scared. One gentleman in there stood up and said, you know, we'll try and get these babies to calm down. Can we, can we get some water for these babies to get them some relief? They brought him up front and shot him. Nobody's standing up being a leader in this. Once they had killed all of the adult males, they grabbed all of the large boys that were in there and said, we're going to use you guys for a work detail. They took them, helped them fortify the building, then took them up to the second floor and murdered all the boys that would possibly have a way of fighting back with them. Still no chaos. They had total control. It was very well planned, and they knew exactly what it was they were doing. Mumbai was another one. Ten separate attacks, all staged at the same point in time. Now, police there were very ill-equipped. They had revolvers. They had some long guns that may or may not have worked. But even think in a city like Cincinnati, 10 separate terrorist attacks happening all at once. The chaos, the carnage, the police running here, running there. Can your hospitals handle this? Can they manage to get 500 people transferred to the hospital in any timely fashion? You're on your own, people. If this type of stuff happens, you've got to be prepared yourself, and you've got to have a plan. Part of the other thing that we really upsets me about this, as we say, 166 killed, 308 wounded. You know, that's the numbers. They were killed. This husband and wife team ran the Jewish Center in Mumbai at the time. They were part of the 166, which were killed. They were killed. They weren't killed. Those are soft terms. Those are terms that were served on a daily basis. They were brutally tortured and mutilated, and this is what they looked like when it was done. They weren't simply killed. This is what you're up against. You had no choice except for to put an end to it as soon as absolutely possible. Oh, now something a little more uplifting, huh? Everybody looks real happy out there. Some traditional facts that we've seen over these active killer events, 98% of them killers are going to act alone. In the schools, the ones that we have seen where they work together, they're generally younger kids. They need that camaraderie. They're, they can't do it their own. They feed off of each other. Uh, the exception that we've seen was San Bernardino, where it was the husband and wife team. But the majority of the time, these, these are acting alone. 80% of the time, they're going to have a long gun, a rifle, or a shotgun with them. And 70% of the time, they're going to have multiple firearms, knives, uh, sometimes explosives, and stuff like that. Most of them will shoot until someone stops or confronts them. 30% commit suicide on site. That stops or confront them is very important because in our Faster Saves Lives program, the firearms get a lot of attention. The media wants to focus on that, but that's only a small part of it. And some of these events, you're able to stop the event by simply somebody in charge confronting these school murderers and saying, stop what you're doing. Mr. Frank Hall of Chardon High School, the athletic coach director, I forget what he was, that was simply it. He was able to say, stop, what are you doing? The murderer turned around and ran out of the school. Other times, that's not enough. Don Huxbrock, Mary Sherlock, Victoria Soto at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Every school, you have people, every business, every church, Every event you act, you have people that if a murderer comes in and starts taking innocent lives, there's a certain number of those people that are going to stand between those murderers and these innocent kids and these innocent people. Give them the option to show up with any tools or any training that they want, and that's what the Faster Saves Lives program does. Firearms have to be a part of it because they are the most effective way at stopping this if it has to get to that point. It's very rare that in these situations, do they take hostages? They're not there to negotiate. If they're there to negotiate, all they're doing is using that time to fortify and to, to take more lives. Of course, they try to avoid contact with police 
A surrender or escape is unlikely. We're starting to see a little more of this. Again, these statistics, they could change after every event. We don't update them every time. So, you know, it may be 33% commit suicide now, but surrender or escape, we're starting to see them go mobile now. We saw that at San Bernardino after the initial attack, they went out and started moving to other locations. That causes a lot of chaos. And again, a dynamic situation, they're more likely to be able to get away. Hit ratio of 50% or less. These are not professional shooters. They're cowards at doing it, but 50% hit ratio may seem high, but think about this. How hard is it for me with no training or practice to shoot somebody from this distance? How hard is it to shoot somebody that's sitting in their desk or hiding underneath a table with very little practice? They engage these people at very close range. 50% may seem high, especially since police1.com says that the hit rate for police is anywhere from 15 to 25%. But again, police officers have bad guys generally shooting back at them at the time, which puts it in a whole different situation. The, uh, the, they choose these locations. That, uh, that signs that you see right there, that is not from here, but we have schools in Ohio that have those two signs on their doors. The one on the right side is required by state law that they have to post on there. And they have other ones right beside it that say we have armed staff for the protection of our staff and children. And I think that's a huge deterrent. These murders generally are no contest for a competent armed civilian or law enforcement officer. We'll show a quick video here of uh, the Columbine shooters, but all I want you to watch in here is how nonchalant these people are. They don't have a care in the world. You'll see them, they're wandering around. At one point, they're drinking coffee. They're throwing their Molotov cocktails. They are not concerned in the least little bit about somebody coming and stopping their killing. And that's why with a little training, a little practice, the number of injured and dead in this can be can be reduced quite a bit. He's shooting there at a unexploded bomb here in the back that they couldn't get to. Again, they're walking around. Here he is just drinking a cup of coffee, wandering around, tossing some Molotov cocktails. Now I want you to watch in this next one. This has been going on for almost 20 minutes now. There are some more survivors just now getting out of that cafeteria and one more back in this area. You'll see 21 minutes after this started, they've been hiding underneath a table and finally get to make their escape. But that's the way that most of these are. They're very task focused. They are there for one certain thing. They're not expecting somebody to confront them. And that's why with a little training and practice, we can make the school staff, we can make the business staff, we can make the church staff very effective. The other part is if you're waiting on outside help and your police officer shows up here at the front door, how long is it going to take him to find the killer that is here or here or here? Schools are extremely large. Time is the only thing that matters in these events. And that's what the whole presentation is about. That's what brought all of this on. These studies come from so I mentioned Mr. Ron Borsch at the SEAL Academy. On average, every single minute that you wait for outside help, five to six more casualties occur. Every single minute that you wait, five to six more casualties. Virginia Tech, there was seven to eight people every minute, and outside of the school, the Safeway shooting with uh, Representative Giffords was the record at 14 to 16 people every single minute. There's not another single emergency out there where we rely 100% on outside help. If you're out at a school or a community and a kid falls in a swimming pool and starts to drown, we don't simply dial 911 and wait for the EMTs to get there. We jump in the pool, we pull the kid out, we pray somebody knows CPR, and we start saving lives while the EMTs are still getting there. Same thing with heart attacks. Somebody has a heart attack in your school or in your church, probably in this business, there are AED devices around. You don't simply dial 911 and hope and pray that somebody outside gets there in time to make a difference. 
Violence in your schools, in your businesses, in your churches should be no different. You have to plan for it and you have to make a difference. And that's what the Faster Saves Lives program does. It allows the staff to stop the killing because that has to start first. And then the medical aid is a huge part of it also. We teach them the uh, tactical combat casualty care, an abbreviated version, so that they can start saving lives and have live viable patients to transfer to the medics when they get there. And we're going to talk about that just a little bit more, but to help you understand this a little bit better, we're going to use the timeline. And again, this isn't my timeline. This isn't my information. This timeline comes out of the Attorney General's report from Sandy Hook Elementary School. And in my opinion, is the best information that we got out of here. They don't know what time it actually started. What they know is at 9.30 a.m., the school doors automatically locked. They were already locked because there was one person, one parent who came to the door after they had locked and had to be buzzed in that morning. So the killing started sometime after 9.30. Sometime after 9.30, the killer entered the building. What do you think happened after that? How long did it take for the 911 call to happen? Everybody thinks they'll call 911. If somebody is there mur trying to murder and kill you, is the first thing on your mind to pull your phone out and dial for help, or is the first thing on your mind to figure out a way to stay alive? If you're under the gun, you're not worried about dialing 911. If you're in another part of the building, you may not even know it is occurring. Virginia Tech, they thought it was construction noise. We did a training event at a school in Central Ohio. We had 45 teachers, police officers, EMTs there to train for the entire weekend. We had spent one and a half days training. We all got together in the cafeteria for a little bit of talk and lecture, and we did not know, but the trainers started one of their staff members in the back part of the school building with an AR-15 with blank rounds, firing blanks, as he walked through the building, getting closer and closer and closer. Two minutes and 40 seconds after he started shooting, did somebody in that cafeteria even notice that it was going on? And the scary part was for me is after we realized what was going on, my brain clicked. And I said, my God, I've been hearing these gunshots for several seconds, and it did not even click that what is going on. And I was there training for this type of events. That's the problem is, again, they, they don't know. The 911 call happened at 9.35.39, so maybe for up to five minutes, he was alone in that school building murdering people and nobody was coming to help. Nobody can come to help until they know that there's a problem. Five minutes, everyone in that building were on their own. The dispatcher, Sandy Hook, phenomenal job. She picked up the phone. She dispatched the call 27 seconds from the time she picked up the phone until she announced the call out to police that there was a shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School. It may be two minutes. It may be three minutes. You may be on hold for five minutes in some large cities. 27 seconds, phenomenal, phenomenal time. The first officer arrived at Sandy Hook Elementary School within three minutes of being dispatched. We had two more officers there 13 seconds later, so just over three minutes after being dispatched, there were three police officers in the parking lot at Sandy Hook Elementary School. There's a police department out there that guarantees you they will have officers in your business, in your church, in your school parking lot within three minutes. I hate to generalize, but they're probably lying to you. Three-minute response time is unbelievably fast. It doesn't get any better than this if you're waiting on outside help. This timeline is the best anyone, anywhere that is relying on outside help could hope for. It does not get any better than that. We lost 20 babies and six adults that day. That's the reality of this. If you wait on outside help, all you're doing is saying X number of dead or injured is acceptable to me, and I'm willing to accept that number, and that's all that I'm going to do. That's not acceptable in this day and age. We know better. We now understand these. And we know what it takes to get these down to the single digits. 
Less than a minute after the police officers arrived, the last shot was heard inside Sandy Hook Elementary School. He took one of his handguns and murdered himself when resistance showed up. They didn't even have to enter the school building, and he was out of the fight. Unfortunately, there was a lot of confusion, a lot of other stuff. They were outside that school building for five minutes and 34 seconds before they even entered the school building. You know, you'd never want to criticize or look back, but if there's a call of somebody shooting inside an elementary school, you pull up, there are cars there, school's in session, you hear shots inside the building. You know, you've got to decide, do you go into that building? Do you not go into that building? The murdering was done by that point in time, fortunately, but that is the timeline. It doesn't get any better than Sandy Hook. If you're waiting on outside help, if that's your plan, that's what you're facing. That's the timeline, and that's the best it gets. The part that doesn't show up in this is when did medical help start in here? It was approximately 30 to 45 minutes after the 911 call before the first medical aid started in Sandy Hook Elementary School. And the only reason for that, because the EMTs, when they come and stage up, they're staging up down the street, waiting for the police to secure the scene, to check every room, to check every locker, to check every desk, to check every door. Then they'll come in and start treating your kids and your family's lives. They were fortunate here. Again, Sandy Hook was kind of different. Those poor little kids and the devastating injuries they had, it likely would not have made much of a difference. One of the first six officers in wrote in his report, he was a prior EMT. He said, after a few minutes being inside the building, I looked around and realized we had enough guns in here. Somebody needed to start medical aid. So he, he started pulling out his medical gear and getting people shipped out of the Sandy Hook Elementary School. Aurora, Colorado, they roll up to a the theater shooting out there. They were very well prepared. They had trauma kits. They had medical supplies. They had training in every one of their cruisers. They show up with 58 people dead, multiple injuries, and they have eight cruisers with eight tourniquets in it. Oops. They couldn't get ambulances in. It was too crowded. Police officers were throwing the injured in the back of their cruisers and driving them to the hospitals to get them treated. Every one that they threw in a cruiser and drove to a hospital, every single one of those persons survived. So they got the treatment that they needed immediately. That's what the Faster Saves Lives program does. It's a huge part of it. The guns get too much of the attention, but you've got to have an effective way of stopping the killing. But getting the crisis management skills, the emergency medical skills, and the trauma training is the key part of it. I, I don't bring it out in public if you want to hear the most horrific thing that you've heard in your life. Pull up the 911 calls from the Townsville, South Carolina school shooting, 911 calls. You hear two different teachers begging for someone to get there and take care of little Jacob Hall, who was shot in the leg in this event. They say he's bleeding badly. He's turning blue. We need help. All the 911 dispatchers can tell them time and time again is we're coming as fast as we can. We can't get there any faster. We're coming as fast as we can. One point in the 911 call, you hear the teacher say he's turning blue. They've got the AED out on him. They're trying to use the AED on him. They're trying to use a defibrillator on somebody who is bleeding profusely from one of the most survivable type of extremity wounds. They wanted to do something. They were doing everything they knew, but they didn't have the tools. They didn't have the training. A simple tourniquet and a simple bit of training possibly could have saved that young man's life. And that is the most aggravating thing that's out there. We started last year giving them trauma medical training to any school that wants it free of charge. All of our trauma kits that they buy from us, their lifetime kits, if they buy a trauma kit from us and never have to use it, we will replace it for them. We started now offering this to the public. There's some flyers going around. If you didn't get one, we actually have a public trauma care kit uh, clinic coming up on April 1st. The simple things, tourniquets, compression bandages, and chest seals. That's how you save lives, not only in active killers, severe weather events, traffic accidents, severe sports injuries, compound fractures. You know, a lot of us grew up in Boy Scouts where we heard tourniquets are the last resort. You put a tourniquet on, you're losing an arm. It's nonsense. A decade of war fighting have proven that that's, that's his old knowledge, just like Pluto is a planet or is not a planet or wherever we left it out. We learn things change. So, again, we encourage you guys, get prepared. Think about these things in your daily lives, in your businesses, in your church, in your schools. And 
make a difference. And my voice did hold up. Now, if we can get through some questions, then I can get myself uh, a drink of water. Are there any questions or comments or anything I didn't cover? Yes, ma'am. Hold on just one second, oh. please. Denise, my question is, what is the best way to approach a school system um, to make sure that they have trauma kits and are, that somebody in the building is trained to use them or several people are trained? Is it best to go to the uh, superintendent? Is it better to go to the um, individual like schools or you know, just any kind of direction? It's tough to say. When we started this program, we really thought it was going to have to be a grassroots effort from the parents and teachers from the bottom side pushing this up, saying we need to do something. Over the past four years, it's been about half and half. Half of it is grassroots people individually pushing from the bottom up. The other half has been superintendents saying, we know we're not doing enough. We've got to do enough. The one thing that I will say is look for a partner. One person, they're the crazy person that's coming and talking about this. If you get two people, well, what do you know? The crazy person found a friend. We'll still ignore them, you know? Find three people, and now suddenly three people's committee. Three people can make a difference. Go in and just simply ask them, you know, if you have a severe weather emergency, everybody likes anecdotes. It was not a severe event. We had one of our teachers call us back that said the year after that she went to opening day of school. All the teachers had their kids in the school. They were doing bulletin boards. They were doing other stuff. They were trying to get ready for it. One of the other teacher's daughters sat down in a chair on a pair of scissors and ran a pair of scissors up into the back of her thigh. A young girl bleeding, it wasn't a severe wound, but it was bleeding. You have a young girl screaming. The teacher said, I was really outraged at how many of my other staff simply fell apart watching a screaming girl sit there and bleed. Didn't require a tourniquet, didn't require anything other than direct pressure. But she said, the four hour block of medical training I had allowed me to take control, to address the situation, to calm everybody down. And you know, that's what we're looking for. Ask them these questions. You know, if you have somebody that cuts themselves in a lab accident, you know, do you have a tourniquet even to stop the bleeding? You know, bleeding out from a severe wound can happen in two minutes' time. It's even less than what we saw there. The other thing that we that we see a lot is, you know, that's something that they haven't thought about. Well, we've got first aid kits. We've we've got this. It's changing quite a bit because you're getting a lot of our military people, who every single one of our war fighters are trained in this now. They know that the most survivable if if they apply a tourniquet to an extremity wound before shock sets in, over 95% survival rate. That's that's huge. That's what we're looking for. Is there other questions? Uh, Fred, uh, what's in a trauma? Oh, that's a great question. We put together what we call our classroom trauma kit, which every teacher that goes through our training, our foundation provides them one. Uh, it contains a tourniquet, three different compression bandages. Those are for extreme bleeding. Again, if you come up to an extremity wound and it is, it is bleeding profusely, the first step is put a tourniquet on it. If it's not right, they'll get to the hospital and say, well, you didn't really need it. Tourniquets are used every day in surgeries. If you're having any type of vascular surgery, they're putting a tourniquet on you while you're, uh, while you're asleep. Compression bandages, chest seals, penetrating chest wounds, uh, especially from bullets, from falls, from other things. Uh, we have uh, compressed gauze, control wrap, triangle bandages, a great way that they can be used for packing wounds. We also show them how to improvise tourniquets with this type of material. Uh, trauma tape, shears, that type of stuff. Our classroom trauma kit is it's $80. We just had a price increase on it. Uh, it is designed for one person to treat two to three injured people at one time. We tell the teachers, keep it in their classroom themselves. If they're lucky, it'll treat nine injuries if the victims have the exact nine injuries that the kit's designed for. From there, we go up to our mid-sized trauma kit, which is designed for like a, a lunchroom concession area. Uh, with that kit, you can have up to five people treat up to about 10 or 12 different people. And then we have an additional full facility kit, which is uh, able to to be used by up to eight people. It has a main kit with all of the supplies in it, plus it has eight individual throw kits, so you can immediately 
If you have trained people, start handing the individual kits and suddenly have eight people working on up to two dozen people. And schools are finally getting this. We had one school in Ohio two years ago. They purchased $8,000 worth of trauma kits to get into every school building in their district. I loved it when I went up there to pick up the check from the treasurer. She told me, she said, I hope I'm wasting this money. I said, God bless you, that's the best thing I've ever heard. Writing an $8,000 check and praying that you're wasting your money on it. I was telling a young lady here earlier, we've got a young Eagle Scout in very northwest Ohio. This great young man decided for his Eagle Scout capstone project that that's what he's going to do. He's going to put a trauma kit in every classroom in his home district, and he's going to get every one of the teachers in the district trained on this, and that's, that's what he's done. We worked with him. We sourced all kits. We provided them to him all at our cost. He packed them together, they're installing them in the kits, and this summer uh, when they are out on break, we're going to go in and train all of the staff in that district also. Question, um, and how do, can businesses be trained and how does that work? Yeah, in fact, uh, we are doing our trauma medical class. It is a, a three-hour abbreviated one. We have hands-on training with the tourniquets, compression bandages, and chest seals, both the commercial type, and we show you how to improvise these also because Again, $80 kits for every classroom in the school can get very expensive. April 1st, we're going to be offering that to the public. There's some flyers around here. Um, as a bonus at that class, you get to hear this same hour lecture that I just did now. But, you know, if, you, if I didn't chase you away after this one, come and sit and see if my voice sounds a little bit better on April 1st or not. And where's the training at? The training will be a premier shooting and training up in Liberty Township. It's a Saturday morning. We're running two classes a nine till two and a noon till five. It is $75 per person. All the proceeds go right back into the Faster Saves Lives program. And if you want to order the trauma kits, we are still giving you them at the $75, which is our 2016 prices on those. Yes. Uh, my name is Ted Day. Hey, uh, that Sandy Hook shooting was particularly really sinister. And I never really heard much background on a, on a the person that did it. Do you have any background on what, how a, how that kid developed such a evil mind? You know, again, that's that's something that a lot of people are studying and trying to figure out the whys of this. Uh, Mr. Phil Chalmers, who I mentioned earlier, does a lot of the anti-violence stuff. He has actually interviewed every teenage murderer who is still alive in the United States. And his book, Inside the Mind of a Teenage Killer, read. The, the upbringings, the situations these kids are in, you know, you hate to say it's not surprising, but it is horrific. Why it causes it, I, I don't know, and I can't speak to that. One thing we know for certain is he spent hours on the computer researching this, studying what the ones before him had done, checking what had worked, what hadn't worked, and planning all of this out. And that's what more and more of these murderers are doing. They're coming in as prepared as possible. I truthfully don't know. What question back here. Uh, Mike Leisling, uh, where do the schools in Ohio stand with training and arming uh, staff? Do you, you know that? In, in Ohio, the school board has total control. It's total local control. The school board gets to decide who is armed in their district and who is not. It can be school teachers, it can be staff, it could be parents, it could be anybody in the community that the school board chooses. Everybody wants to know how many armed districts are there in Ohio, and I really wish I could tell you, but that local control is the key to it all. Some districts are very public about it. They come right out and they will tell you they have signs on the front door. One we just had up in Mad River put a video out announcing that they were doing this. Other districts, you will have school staff that are sitting together at a lunch counter. One of the school staff is armed, and the other one doesn't even know they have armed people in the schools. So it's up to each individual district. What I know is since 2013, we have trained 778 staff from 192 districts. Now, that does cover eight states. The large majority is here in Ohio. I will tell you, not all of those are authorized at this point. But I also know there are a lot of other schools, such as Edgewood down here, such as Sydney City Schools such as Edgerton schools who had armed staff by working with their local sheriff and police long before they ever came and talked to us about getting training. So all we can do is let you know exactly what has worked with us.
and that's that's 192 districts to date. So would you would you sense that maybe it's 50 or 60 districts in Ohio? There's 600 districts, right? Uh, yeah, the six to seven hundred charters and all of those come into it. Um, we have had superintendents tell us two years ago we were over 100 districts already. Okay. I mean, we had one district that attended our very first training program in 2013. They went back, they authorized. We never knew they were authorized till 2016 when one of the superintendents went into the district from somebody else that we knew and found out that they had been authorized. They went home, they did it, they never let us know about it. And, and that's their business. I mean, it's kind of good and bad because I had somebody come in from Louisiana and say, you've got a great program that you can't tell anybody about. And unfortunately, that's a problem that we've got here. Other questions? Um, it's maybe on the back. Hi, this is Ken Bowman. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb on this question. Um, after all these incidents, of course, the politicians come out and talk about gun control. And most of these incidents have happened after the 1960s when the um, Supreme Court outlawed prayer in our schools. Do you think if we brought prayer back in our public schools over the next generation or two, we might be able to help solve this problem so our kids never have the chance to really hear the Word of God in school anymore? I would be in favor of that. How much of a difference that makes, we've only put in divine hands. It's just, you know, there are lots of causes, there are lots of issues. You hear about the medication on this, you hear about the upbringing of this. You know, there are so many answers that schools can look at. And that's why I said this is not the end all be all. This is the absolute last line of resort when everything else has failed. We want multiple overlapping layers of protection in this. We want to identify these kids ahead of time. We want to harden the schools. When I first started this, I could walk into school buildings for a school board meeting and I could wander around and 50% of the schools, nobody would say a word to me because I'm dressed nice, I look nice, I'd walk right in the front door. We had one of the guys we were talking with and uh, he said, yeah, said you, what you need to do is when you walk in there, said, just, just go find the, the, uh, the boys' bathroom and stand by the boys' bathroom and get one of the kids' names. So you want to see a school district flip out? Tell them that, yeah, you were just in the bathroom alone talking to little Johnny who's in Mrs. Perkins' class. You know, 50% of the schools you could walk into still today, that's got to change. That's simple stuff that they can change. And don't just make it window dressing. So many of them, they have the locking doors, but who is monitoring that buzzer? They see somebody walk up there and they buzz them in. Yep, it's another person, it's another person. Empower your staff, tell them they can make a difference. Question here. Do you actually provide the training for people for act for shooting if they want to have some armed guards at the school? And my other question is, I think Kentucky really bought into this, didn't they? I think they have quite a few schools that are on this program. Yeah, any school which is choosing to have firearms as part of their safety program, our foundation will provide this training to them. And we're doing it as low cost as possible. It used to be totally free. This year, our foundation is granting training for up to five staff from every school district that wants it. So we do provide that to them. Kentucky has some ups and downs. Um, talking to some groups in Kentucky, uh, evidently you have Louisville and then you have Kentucky. And in the education system, Louisville is all that matters and they have not come around on it yet. Some of the other ones are slowly getting there. Uh, Mr. Joe Khalil with the post protecting our students and teachers, I think is the acronym down there, has done a lot of work. Fortunately, they haven't got a lot of traction at this point. Question. Uh, Fred, uh, I sell restaurant equipment, uh, tired. Uh, I, years ago, I just used to walk in the school, front door, back door, wherever. And at least the schools are hardening to where you either have to ring in or you have to go yeah. through the gate, through the, the front office or something. It is, and you know, the sad part is, is the part Ohio Department of Education last year decided they used to list the schools that were delinquent in filing their safety plans with the Attorney General, which every school in Ohio is required to do. They list the schools that were delinquent or behind in that. They had so many of them that they couldn't get compliant last year, they decided to stop listing the schools. So you know that solved the problem. <laughs> Oh, hey, my name is Ted. Hey, uh, have you been watching the series The Walking Dead? 
I've seen parts of it, yes. I mean, My daughter the, is a... The teenagers uh, are really into that, but that yeah. is the most violent, sick series I've ever seen in my life. And it's on every week, and these kids just get engrossed at how, how violent they could be. It, is that, is that could be leading to some more of these shootings? You know, we're back to the same thing. There are lots of things, a lot of the video games, the stuff we, we inoculate ourselves to that. That's all part of the training we use. Our foundation president is an airline pilot for American Airlines. He goes into simulators and practices this. What are video games? What are all this other stuff? Basically simulators for this type of stuff. What do we use for the teachers? We use simulators. We put them in stressful situations where they have to make decisions, where they have to make the right decisions, where they have to use their tools and their training because that stress inoculation, then when the, each event that they go to, they're a little more prepared for and they're a little more prepared for. Joe, we have time for two more questions. Okay. Joe, Bob, appreciate you coming out and doing this. Is there, for the purpose of, of you know, like tonight, is there a, a light version of the class that you teach that touches on the fact that, you know, speed is of the, of the essence. It's important when they're there and they're trying to organize the room and organize the people and contain people that people act, okay? Is there a class that talks about the use of fire extinguishers and the use of other tools that are in the room that the general public can have? Talk about field expedient things. We talk about chest seals. Well, everyone who has a driver's license can put a driver's license on a sucking chest. Well, duct tape and we talk about the fact that we do a, a tourniquet. That people still have shoelaces on their shoes. You know, all of these kind of common sense things that just if you if you could bubble up the broader public. I mean, I know we have a we've worked very hard over the last 40 years at professionalizing the first responders. And we've then got a lot of people who all stand back and wait for the first responders to show up. And is there a class to try to rattle and gain the awareness of the public to that? That is more than window dressing for the greater course that could help the broader public. Thank you. Uh, and that's what I mentioned. We are doing the medical class specifically on April 1st. We're opening this up for the public that anybody that wants to attend it, this is the same block that we do for the teachers. It covers both the commercial uh, medical supplies and the improvised supplies. As far as the time factor on it, we cover a lot of that in the medical part. And part of this will be the same presentation here. How can we get that out to more people and to get them to just this year as needed to mention? We're starting to try and reach outside of the schools. Our focus for four years has been get this in the schools where it's going to do the good. We're doing pretty good with that now, but you know we've got to start branching this out if we can and making a difference. And the April 1st session is how long? Is it three hours? It is actually five hours. The five. medical part is three hours. Then you've got this part, which is about an hour and a half. So Okay, last question. Yeah, this, this is Mike. Uh, this is kind of a statement more than a question, but I want to throw it out here because uh, a friend of my uh, son's, a, a, a classmate of his, I was talking to him and he was. I, he said his father. Uh, he said my father's dying. And I said really. I, said, I hate to hear that. And he said well, he's got all these mental problems and he actually wants to commit suicide, mm -hmm. but he's kind of afraid to. And he, I said, uh, Chris. I said man, I, I really hate to hear that. I said, can't you get help for him? And what he told me, and I don't know this is true, and you may know more about this, but he said that mental health in this, I don't know if you say in the country, but in the state or in this area, there isn't mental health facilities anymore like there used to be. And that there, and, and you hear so much about this, and I, I believe it's true. There's a lot of crazy people running around out there that commit things like these kind of uh, horrendous, you know, things like this in the schools, but yet there's not any mental health and, and uh, what can, you know, yeah. what can we do as, as taxpayers? And we spend a lot of time on that in the, the pro-Second Amendment, right, because the number of people that are injured or killed with firearms is way too many. You know, a lot of it is criminal misuse, but the unfortunate thing, two-thirds of it, over 20,000 people every single year are suicides with firearms. Out of the 30,000, it's 20,000 people a year. And that's, that's sad. That's outrageous. You know, it's not a firearm problem, unfortunately. That, as you said, is a mental health problem. But then we have to make sure how do we handle that without stigmatizing the mental health. Already has 
a stigma to it in the United States, and a lot of people that need the help are afraid of going to get the help because of interactions with their families, because of their jobs, because of their professional things. So it's really something that, again, people a lot more experienced than I am are going to have to work out, but it's a huge problem. And you know, the unfortunate reality is, is that suicides with firearms are generally very effective, and that's why it skews the numbers so much, is that People use the firearms for suicide. It generally is a successful suicide attempt. Let's thank our guests for coming. What a, what a great informative session. Thank you very much, Joe, for coming. And uh, Nita, Nita has been telling me about this um, presentation for a long time. I feel like we're kind of been slow on this one. So uh, it, it was great to hear that. And uh, April 1st, remember that date um, to get information. Listen, everybody, thanks for coming. We hope to see you next week at our three sessions, and um, have a good night. Thank you, everyone.